Rhea Walter, thank you very much for joining us here at Cities for Tomorrow. Um, here's the question that we're going to wrestle with for the next 20 minutes or so, and hopefully, if we have some time, get some questions in at the end. At a time when American cities appear ever more separated culturally from the rural places that feed them, and our food supply chain appears ever longer and more knotted, running from farms that are fighting the effects of climate change to cities that need to feed both the poor and the wealthy, how are we to address two issues? Food insecurity on the one hand and food waste on the other. We're going to start big and then we're going to narrow in. But starting big with a big thesis statement, I'd like to put that question to both of you. Um, well, if I could just maybe add, I think in addition to food waste and food insecurity, um, I'm the head of a big national environmental organization that focuses a lot these days on climate change. So I think in addition to, you know, how do we get more food into people's mouths? How do we, how can we become more healthy and how can our planet become healthy? Food actually is an incredible leverage point. Um, uh, from uh, from the very beginnings uh, with respect to the agricultural system as well as uh, into directly the homes uh, of, of our families. Yeah, and add to this, uh, good afternoon everybody, to the uh, to this sort of theme of this conference, you think about the cities of the future. I've been listening, you know, the last number of sessions. One, it's people first, remembering that it's built in th with and through people. Second of all, it's from the ground up. We've heard the difference between the disconnect between the different levels and remembering that real work happens through partnership and, and connection at the, uh, with the various groups. And, and third is that there's a, there's a sense of resilience or innovation that's reminded you heard the two mayors with their ideas. And so you know, those sort of principles, I think, inform where we're going to go here. But remember that food is, um, food is the, most, it's one of the, most, it's the most robust sector uh, in the economy. It's about a trillion dollars in the United States, plus or minus. Uh, people have to eat, so it's always there. And what's really intriguing is, as you think about the cities of the future, is how are you going to use food to build an ecosystem of success, right? So we'll talk more about that. But uh, obviously, we have, we have 6,300 communities in this country that don't have access to fresh food in the way that we all enjoy. It's there. You can look it up on the USDA ERS website. We've got a big problem. In this country, we waste about 40% of the food we produce. Those are the headline statistics. And, and, they're, and, it's, and, and they're deeply problematic. Yeah. The, the chain begins at the farm. You were talking about land use, and I'd like to return to that. And, and Ria, if you could talk to us a little bit about what it is that we in the cities can do to address this issue that's happening on farms, where climate change is wreaking havoc on farmers' ability to make the very food that we want to bring to market. Well, I, I think a couple things. First off, um, the, the latest IPCC report that came out maybe a month ago um, underscored the importance of soil health and forestry as natural sinks for carbon. So there's kind of nothing easier to do than to ensure that our soils are healthy and that our forests are healthy because those, that, those again, naturally suck up a lot of the carbon that's already in the atmosphere. Part of how we get to a point where soils are more healthy is through regenerative agriculture, um, uh, which increasingly, I think, has become something that people look for when they purchase produce. Um, it's not only what they purchase, but where they purchase it and how far away those products are from the homes they live in. Um, in a city like New York, which we both live in, uh, I mean, it's gigantic, and it doesn't feel like there's farmland for millions and millions of miles. At the same time, a lot of the produce that actually does come into New York City actually is from locally produced areas just upstate. Um, and so figuring out how to, I guess, reduce the transit time, um, create greater connectivity with the people that are actually growing our food, um, and also working with farmers, with ranchers, with soil scientists to ensure that the soils that we have are actually living, um, you know, and healthy, breathing organisms in, the, in and of themselves. So at the other end uh, of, of that chain is the retail market, a subject you know something about, Mr. Rob. Um, here in New Orleans, and we were just in the green room talking about this and on the phone checking our statistics, and we, we know that there is about one market for every 14,000 residents of the city of New Orleans. We also know that fully half of the low-income residents of this city uh, lack a market within three miles of their homes. And I'm wondering, 
h how is it that you now, not, not as Whole Foods, Rob, but um, uh, looking back, how is it that retailers are going to address that fact in this city and in others? Yeah, I mean, I think recognizing the problem first, it's not a, it's not a fact that's widely known, but I think it's going to take acts of courage on, in the behalf of various businesses. And you, you, you know, ours was an act of mission for Whole Foods to go to the inner city of Detroit, work with uh, the mayor and Mayor Bing before him. And we said that we, we were here as a company to, to uh, bring healthier food to the world. And it was a personal mission for me. And so we, we ended up opening that store at, in, in mid-city Detroit. And it was something that Wall Street laughed at and said, why in the world would you do that? And so now you do have a new vehicle, the Opportunity Zones, that gives you some economic cover to say you're going to make that investment. But all this has to start with some form of access. It's hard to convey to you that in these areas, even the public transportation systems don't work. In many cases, folks have to take three or four buses uh, to get there, to get to a physical store. It's just not there. And uh, you can go in the city of Chicago, the north side of the city has all sorts of choices. The south side has much more limited choices. It's just, it's a disparity that's, that's, that's really troubling because when you track it ultimately to health outcomes, and these are public health statistics you all can check, but in the city of Detroit or in the city of Chicago, the life expectancy between an area like Englewood or the mid-cities Detroit at that time is something like 12 years less of life expectancy than areas right around it. There's a, so you're talking about not just an economic question, you're talking about a moral question of human potential that's being left because of the lack of access. So, you know, we have to talk about opportunity zones, we have to talk about farmers markets, we have to talk about uh, the WIC and the SNAP programs. None of, there's lots of ways to go at this, but it starts with can we improve the access to the fresh food in these areas? I know you're going to jump in, and I, I, and I want you to jump in particularly on farmers markets, because I know NRDC has done a lot of work in that sort of advocacy for the growth of farmers markets, and I'm wondering, can they scale? So I think we have seen it scale. I mean, this is what's yeah. so remarkable about food, is that you can make conscious choices individually every single day with what you put in your mouth or what you buy at the grocery store or where you buy it, and that actually collectively has changed the world, right? So I, I do think that we're see, seeing a scale um, of great proportions that is dramatically changing our behaviors. At the same time, I, I really do want to kind of jump on this point. I think it's not just about how we convince the whole food retailers or the farmer markets to go into neighborhoods that are historic food deserts. It's about going and putting um, uh, or some advocacy pressure, I dare say, on the existing merchants that are there. So let me just give you a specific example. A lot of folks um, in lower income communities go to dollar stores, Dollar General, dollar stores. They're, they're ubiquitous amongst a lot of low income communities. Um, recently, Dollar General agreed that they would start to actually have fresh produce in their stores. We're trying to work with them through our partners, um, Environmental Justice Health Alliance and others, mm. to encourage them to source that food from locally produced farmers that are in the neighborhood as well. Again, that complete circle of opportunity. So I think finding those opportunities with existing merchants as well as trying to attract new opportunities for other merchants is kind of part of the that yeah, you know, Walgreens did that in Chicago and, and also the LA Food Policy Council, which is another thing that cities could form these. There's some really good ones. Detroit has a very good one. LA has a good one. And they're working with the corner stores to try to help them to develop their selection of products, so to her point. Uh, but I've just seen in Detroit, and essentially corner to corner, there's basically fast food joints and they can track the use of SNAP dollars and food, you know, and they can actually see where they're spent and where they're spent, is, you know, suggest there's just a dearth of access in those cities. So. So, so two points. One, the, the USDA classifies fruit and vegetables, the stuff that we're supposed to be eating more of every day, every year, as a specialty crop. And that, I assume, means that it's, they're hard to grow, they're hard to keep fresh, they're hard to get to market. Your work, Walter, with Stonewall Rob, um, has encouraged some disruptive business models that are meant to address that. Can you talk a little bit about the direction those startups are going and what they're trying to do? So which one are you thinking about in particular? Well, I'm thinking about shelf life in particular. Okay, got it, all right, okay. <laughs> well, what's interesting, we are seeing an inflection point in food uh, that we haven't seen since the uh, end of World War II. As you all know, out of World War II came the pesticides and the fertilizers from the war materials that, that, it, that fueled an era of production agriculture like the likes of which we've never seen. 
But where we are now is the, is the emergence of a new sort of biological agriculture and this a whole new sleuth of companies saying we can do things and do things in working with nature that's going to actually outperform synthetics. The company that Sam's referring to, this is an incredible company that's at this convergence of food and tech and data. It's called Appeal Sciences. The CEO is James Rogers, top 50 disruptor company. What he's come up with is a, uh, through, he's using food waste, it's grass and it's organic, and he's, he's, it, it extends the shelf life of food. So he stops the oxidation, it stops the When you buy a fresh piece of fruit, it it's immediately starts to die. But he's come up with a way to coat this in a way that prevents that from happening. He started with avocados, now asparagus, citrus. So imagine the application of that in the inner cities where, say, if you had cleared a store to do it, the reason they don't want to do it is not because they don't like you or think you've got a good idea. It's because it goes bad, and they've got to throw it out, and it costs them money. This technology is going to enable them to put that on shelf. It'll stay there uh, and be able to stay uh, ready for sale and in good shape for the customer. It's a remarkable company, and we're seeing across the across the sort of spectrum. The other one is is Food Maven, which is going at the food waste problem by creating basically a tech platform and logistics to to take food that's currently lost in the system and and make a market for it into retail food service. And so we're, that's going to extend access. Again, we'll work on the access from that. So there's a new generation of companies thinking biologically as opposed to synthetically that are using the tools of the era, which is the technology and the data, to start to go at this question of access. It's very exciting, actually. But not all of them. Not and this all. Is, this is one of the, the key points that we need to make, and we have like you to talk about it, which is that for a lot of industrial farmers, um, the notion that we're going to use some disruptive technology to make these crops grow better and last longer is, they're not there yet. They're still using pesticides of, of kind of horrendous effect on, on, uh, on our land and, and on the vegetables and fruits them, themselves. NRDC sued the government over the use of one of them, which is based on a nerve agent cast, um, and prevailed. Um, can you talk about that campaign? Sure. So there's um, a pesticide uh, that it was, is, is used in agricultural uh, purposes, but also was used in household products. Um, the, the EPA decided to ban its use in household products because it's highly toxic and um, uh, in particular, very, very uh, dangerous for young children. Now, um, as Walter said, I mean, this, this pesticide was actually developed by the Nazis in World War II as a nerve gas agent, um, and through the industrialization of agriculture has been now applied to the agricultural system. So, um, literally, it sounds completely ludicrous, but this stuff is being sprayed all over our broccoli, all over our berries, all over our lettuces, and we have been, been petitioning the EPA for years to get it banned. Um, the Obama administration was very close to actually banning it um, before they left office, and surprise, surprise, the Trump administration completely walked back from that ban. So we sued the Trump administration and prevailed a couple of months ago in the Ninth Circuit, um, where the judge ordered the EPA to actually take the stuff off the shelves. I just want to add, you know, an or organic product, which, uh, which doesn't use those, also fixes six times the amount of carbon in the soil. So you get a two for one in terms of the environmental, in terms of climate change that has been discussed in other panels today. I, w I want to make something about the access, though, which is, uh, unless you want to No, go, go ahead. right ahead, just, sir. Just that, again, one of those basic principles, I think, that I'm taking away from this gathering, people first, on the ground, from the ground up, is also, you know, we didn't just drop like a stork into Detroit and build the store. The food access has to be done in partnership. There are communities that are, that are really owning their future. That are, and, and this is true in Englewood, where I'm working right now, uh, you know, Teamwork Englewood. They have put together a quality of life. They have a vision for how they want their community to unfold, which, by the way, addresses gentrification because they themselves address it with the type of community they envision. You work as a partner in partnership with that as opposed to saying, I'm just going to go in there and open up a store. That's not the way it's going to work optimally. The cities of the future are going to be built through these associations with companies who are willing to do that, community groups that step up and have a vision, and the government has a role to play in terms of, you know, this is the truth, the mayors have helped us, but they, you know, this is how it's actually going to happen, I think. One issue we haven't discussed yet is immigration, and um, immigration plays a huge role in our food world, from farms to restaurants, uh, and a gigantic role in um, mm -hmm. getting the food to market, um, and in keeping it safe along the way. Mm -hmm. um, how do you both um, uh, regard this issue of immigration 
and food safety, immigration and food work, immigration and restaurant work? Well, I mean, I think we're just fundamentally going backwards right now. Uh, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of farmers. They simply can't get the work done. And it, it's actually driving further automation, which probably would happen anyways, because they simply are unable to get the people. There's lots of food that's just going to waste on the ground because they don't have the resources to pick it. Rhea? Well, from, uh, from our perspective, we've been deeply concerned about the health of farm workers in particular. Um, you know, we mentioned chlorpyrifos, but in addition to that pesticide, there's num a number of other pesticides. And so it's not just the workers in the field, it's their families that live in the neighborhoods right next door. And so figuring out a way to actually try to move towards more of a regenerative system, more of a natural system, less pesticides, it's not only good for the consumer, it's good for the producer. Now, I know we want to get a couple of questions in from the audience before uh, we go to the break, but Ria, I want to return before we do to this question of regional food systems. You mentioned New York, which benefits from the farms of eastern Long Island and of the Hudson Valley. Do you, in your view of the United States as a whole, see that to be a, a possible solution for most of our large cities, or are there places where this is going to be a more intractable issue? Well, it's interesting. I think that uh, Walter's obviously much more of an expert on distribution systems, but I do think that people, again, are voting with their forks, right? And that is, in fact, changing the way we think and changing the opportunities we have for innovation. And so I, 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 I do think that this is a, an inflection point. This is a, an incredibly interesting moment in time for lots of different reasons. Um, but food in particular is just, it's, it's the most leverageable, the most fantastic thing. It's so intimate. Um, we have, in fact, again, changed the world through our own activities. It directly has to do with our health and with the state of the environment. It's a huge contributor to carbon, both food waste as well as food production. Um, and it is the key to really thinking about poverty and inequity in lots of our cities. As you can see, food, the single most important issue you're going to hear about today. Um, we've got time for a couple questions, and there are a couple mics here, and I can't see anyone until those lights came up, but there's a, someone in the second row. Sir. Thank you. Um, we do some work in uh, low-income communities across the country. We just opened a grocery store. We'll be having a ribbon cutting and grocery store in the south side of Chicago. I'm looking again at a neighborhood in Washington, D.C., and I had a chance to sit with a retail broker. And one of the things he told me is that in the next five years, you're going to see more change in the grocery business than you've seen in the last 25 years. Rob, can you talk a little bit about that? What, what should we expect? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, the, the, the actual retailing of the future in groceries is actually happening in China right now. And, and uh, the, the major Chinese retailers, um, it, it's incredible the way they've integrated digital, physical, and mobile. But in short, uh, you're, you're seeing the market pivot to fresh. Center store will collapse. You'll see the integration of all sorts of online and delivery options. The online delivery will go to 20% by 2025. So the customer today expects to be able to go online and access whatever they want in any way that they want it at any time that they want it. The, the brands that will be successful that will, will those that serve them. So I think that or, or, or dialing it down and really serving a community through curation and experience and connection become a, tr a true part of the, the community fabric, uh, the stores will look like that. So. So uh, center aisle, you mean cans and boxes? Yeah, that's, Fresh that's on the that'll go to an automatic refill mode. Look, when I, before I left Whole Foods, we were working on a, on a, on a, with one of the major appliance brands so that you, on your phone you couldn't be looking into your refrigerator, and as you were coming home, you could order. It would be a Whole Foods refrigerator. You could order, and you could have it uh, shipped home by the time you got home. So this connected world... It will inform the grocery store of the future. And, and folks are moving fresh. And folk, the new generation of customers wants food. They, food is sexy again. Food is sexy again. I've been People want to know who's doing it, how are they doing it, what am I eating? And this new millennial generation is all about tell me the story around food. Another one. Hi. Sir. Oh, someone's got a mic I, already. I got a mic, so I got You got it. Go first. Can't, I can't even see, see you. <laughs> can't see them. Right? Um, Hi, so I run an organization here in New Orleans called Market Umbrella, and we operate farmers markets throughout the city and do public health programs. One of the things that I've observed as we've expanded from three to now will be seven in January, is that we have a dearth of young farmers, um, particularly minority farmers um, in Louisiana and Mississippi. So can you talk a little bit about what you think are successful strategies to increase the profitability of farming for small um, local producers on which all of this food porn depends? 
<laughs> so, um, you know, the example that I gave uh, of the dollar store campaign that we're doing with our local partners, it's specifically focused in Albuquerque, where they are trying to work with local farmers, literally farmers that are growing crops on their plots of land within the city limits. Um, uh, figuring out ways to not only try to expand that through either distribution or ways to try to encourage that. So uh, another example is um, is the South Bronx. It's it's actually the the kind of gateway for all of the fresh fruits and vegetables that go into 22 million people in New York City. Um, and the irony is that a lot of those fresh fruits and vegetables don't end up in the Bronx, right? It just goes right through the Bronx. Um, so they're not only not getting the the benefit, they're not realizing the opportunity. Opportunity. And so creating a local food hub in collaboration, again, with local community partners, because they always have to be taking the lead, um, it enables not only, again, the opportunity to get the, the product, but the opportunity to participate in creating the product through uh, urban farm systems um, uh, and local agriculture, which actually is possible in, in the Bronx. It really is. So you, you have to ask the question, what is a farm? Because now people are farming vertically in the cities, they're farming in, in, in concrete buildings, and they're farming with air they're farming and they're a lot of times without soil so this whole idea of what it means to be a farmer is completely there's a lot of technologists who now become farmers I would say this the Rockefeller Foundation who's part of this gathering it's got a very wonderful program on right now up at uh, up on the Upper Hudson they've got 800 young farmers from around the world that are learning about uh, about farming so there are some good programs out there but the average age of a US farmer is about 65 years old right now we have a challenge we got time for another one right here Great, thank you. I actually want to resurface a question that was asked earlier in regards to uh, produce that is trained across the country versus things that are grown locally. Is it feasible economically to have uh, like a major metropolitan area fully fed by farms that are surrounding in sort of like a hundred mile donut, for example? Uh, is that something that is actually achievable to eliminate food traveling unnecessary distances? The real question is, uh, I mean, the great trajectory we're on here with the quality of food is accessibility and affordability. Uh, these things that started out, we started out with in the 70s and 80s around uh, doing things more sustainably, uh, the, the price continues to come down. The question is, can, can you do it? Yes. But can everybody participate in that now? No. And so really what has to happen is we have to continue on that road. Uh, uh, and it, we, you know, we use 100 miles as kind of a local definition, but so it's a great thing to think about, but it's not possible right now for everybody, for everybody to participate. So I, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just add that the reason why something like you know, iceberg lettuce has to travel literally thousands of miles to get to your dinner plate is, 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 is part of um, I think a now outdated system, both a government system as well as a market-based system, um, that doesn't work for either the producer or the consumer any longer. And, and, and as we've heard, I think we're seeing different types of shifts in behavior and different types of shifts in technology. We are advocating very strongly for also a shift in government regulation and government behavior because a lot of times that's what drives things. I mean, you talk about food waste, Food labeling is the most irrational thing, right? It means nothing, literally, on every single product with the exception of um, uh, uh, formula, infant formula. Those labels mean nothing. They're not regulated by the federal government. And, and the things that are regulated by the federal government, I mean, hello, romaine lettuce, right? They're not being regulated very well right now. And so I think the opportunity to think through those kind of system-wide approaches to really, again, meet the demands and the needs, not only of our world, but of us as individuals is, well, is just, huge. One just quick nugget. Um, think about this. Climate change itself is changing how things are growing. So you can now grow a mango in L.A. You couldn't do that five years ago. So it kind of blows the mind when you say, what's a regional food system? Climate change has got that whole thing on the move. We could do a whole conference on what on where that romaine came from and how we were we failed to, to, yeah, we to track it. Um, but we can't do that because we got to take a short break right now. These guys have been fantastic. 